Hello, Indigo children. I am Pruitt, and this is Brother Jim. And today we align our chakras, transcend the mortal coil, and enter the astral plane on WebDM. Today's show is brought to you by Audible a great place to get inspiration for your characters and campaigns. Visit audible.com slash webdm or text webdm to 500-500. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals are free. My recommendation for great inspiration on Audible comes from history. A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuckman is one of the most engaging and evocative accounts of medieval life you'll ever hear, and it's been one of the best sources of ideas for my D&D campaigns. We've recommended A Distant Mirror on the show before, now listen on us. Once again, go to audible.com slash webdm or text webdm to 500-500. All right, Jim, let's, uh, let's elevate this planar knowledge. Oh. Let's talk about the astral plane. Yes. We've already done our little intro. We've talked about the planes, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. is in general. But let's let's dig in on the on the on the space beyond. <laughs> Into the meta the metaphysical realm of the astral plane. Because I mean this isn't just space, right? Well, but I mean, first off, it, it literally is no space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah, it's not just like it's not like outer space. Although I think you can you can sort of like look at it like that. But a little bit. It's one of the transitive planes, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in sort of great wheel cosmology D and D, which is a, you know, every version of D and D changes and alters the cosmology just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, in sort of like high planescape in, uh, you know, cosmology, the astral plane is one of two transitive planes that, that is, they mostly exist as connections between the prime material and another cluster of planes, in this case, the outer planes. Mm -hmm. And it is the realm of the purely mental. Yeah. It is a, it is a place, well, that's a misnomer. This, it's going to happen a lot because uh, it, it literally has no physicality to it. It is a non-spatial, non-plane, uh, according to the second edition uh, Guide to the Astral Plane. So, so not to give Dave Matthews any more than they're due, but it is the space between. God damn it. I just, I just <laughs> finally did it. I ran him off. Um, no, but... but I don't know if, if, if the cosmology yeah. is like a Ziploc container and the planes are all a bunch of things in there. It's just yeah. kind of the thing that's in between it. Like, not necessarily like yeah. like the Phlogiston sure, or anything, sure. yeah. but it, like just those those little gaps in between where planes brush up against each other. Yeah, yeah. And to me, I think like it, it really forces the issue of what does it mean for the outer planes to be considered a place you can go to? Yeah. If they are connected to the material plane, which I think we should take the fact that it's called the material plane very seriously. Um, well, yeah. If, if, Words have meaning. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if belief fuels the outer planes, if, if belief is enough to change the reality of those places and they are connected by this purely mental realm, mm -hmm. then can we even say that it's possible to go to those places physically? Like maybe the, the only way that you can is through the process of, say, death and, and a soul being uh, transferred from the material to whatever mm -hmm. abode that their god uh, lives in. And, or clicking your heels three times and saying there's no place like home. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and just like willing, maybe, you know, sort of willing it into existence. Yeah. I, I think it raises those kind of questions. I know d d sort of sidesteps that by saying that the magic of the place or the magic of how you get there sort of creates a body for you and, and the fact that it is a mental place with the traits of physicality is part of what makes it a, a fantastical location. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to any of this, but I do think it is something that, as DMs, you want to consider because D&D &D has had very wildly kind of vacillating uh, approaches to how you portray these, these planes that are really mental states. They're, they're states of mind and states of being, not like a place you go to. And yet you still want to be able to have them accessible for adventures and the like, and... Personally, I find 4th edition's take on the Astral Sea to be the best 
of yeah. both worlds for this. Yeah. <laughs> literally about to ask you what's your favorite version. Uh, uh, I really like second editions, uh, you know, the Planescape version, and I think the second edition uh, book, The Guide to the Astral Plane uh, by Monty Cook, is it's filled with amazing ideas for just how to adventure in, in the location. We'll go over some of those uh, yeah. with I, you guys. Do I need to be on a mind-altering substance to understand it. I mean, you might. There are, it's in that, it's in that second edition style of mixing uh, in-universe prose with game mechanics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like, hey, Burke, you know, if you don't want to end up in the dead box you know, or something like that, or dead book, uh, you know, and you're just like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the game mechanic out of this paragraph <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of thing. So it's a, di- you know, it's a different style of, of, of rule book, but it's also like just oozes and, and drips and whatever grotesque metaphor you want to use, flavor and, and, and ideas. And you're just sort of like reading something about how, say, um, you know, the, the devils in hell keep track of all the conduits that come through the astral plane. Immediately it's just like, oh my God, you would have a whole bureaucracies devoted to it. So, oh my God. Like anyway, you know. Half the devils in hell would be. <laughs> of like all the different roads of, of how you get there. You know, the astral plane is this place that, uh, depending on how you present it, it's a either a barren uh, sort of location that you just pass through on the way to, to other places, or it is the source of, uh, you know, sort of adventure itself. And I think... Like, considering what it means, what does it mean for there to be a place that you can adventure in that is purely mental? Like, what kind of changes do you need to make for the game? That, that's worth thinking about and considering, because, like you were mentioning, it, part of the appeal of the astral plane is that it does kind of have that outer space kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things and a lot of adventures that you can have there that very strongly resemble sci-fi, science mm-hmm. fantasy type space adventures... And if you're not looking for a full-on, say, Spelljammer campaign yeah, or, yeah. or something like that, then a quick jaunt to the astral and a, you know, riding around on an astral Drummond or a skiff or something and fighting Githyanki on a dead god asteroid can be a fun one-shot or something. You know? Yeah, and besides, <laughs> in the astral plane, no one can hear you dream. Oh, God. Yeah, God. actually, they, they all can, because it's the whole point. <sighs> yeah. yeah, it's a deep one today, Jim Ooh. Davis. I'm in a mood. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but can you answer the question, though? Jim? All right, let's try. What is it? What is it? I think, and this is, this is taken from the second edition uh, book, that it, the, the interpretation I like the best is it's the backstage to reality. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I, I really like that, that, that it implies a kind of intelligent design to the cosmos, to the Great Wheel, which I suppose literally is true because it's the product of real, actual human beings' imaginations, but whatever. But uh, do the characters <laughs> in the game know that? And, I mean, that's, that's the real <laughs> and question. And the proper do. That's the real question. Uh, they, is, there three cook, of, is there cookism? <laughs> <laughs> Those poor, uh, poor Planescape people. Uh, yeah, and, and so it's like, it's, it's a place where, for instance, the rules support you getting out faster and easier than you can finding locations within it. Yeah. It's a place that you're supposed to fly over, to pass through. It, there's not really anything there. It's the silver void or, or something like that. And the, the interpretation of it being kind of the, the backstage to reality, I, I really like because... It uh, number one, it does imply that that someone or some force or some power created this cosmos, mm-hmm. and this is the connective tissue that joins the homes of the gods with the lo- with the domain of their mortal followers, and it allows the passage of spirits from the material plane to the outer planes, the passage of prayers and spells and knowledge. It allows, uh, you know, servants and, and the like from the gods to travel to the material plane. It's this thing that has clearly like a higher purpose or a place that has a higher purpose that it seems just like mortals just found a way to break into it. Like they're not supposed to be here. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, first off, there's nothing here. There's no native inhabitants to the astral plane. The only thing that's there is stuff that gets sucked in from the material plane or dead gods. You know, like that's it. It's the graveyard of gods, and so in that sense, I I really uh, I, I like that second edition sort of approach, but would kind of combine it with that astral sea from fourth edition, where it's like, it's not just that this is the backstage of reality, or like this is how you get to the homes of the gods, but like, this is where the homes of the gods are located. You know, they they are 
formed on these, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, earthbergs or, or nuggets, uh, pockets Which, of reality. Yeah, astral <laughs> islands. Or... Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they have realms here that you can uh, travel to and seek admittance into. And say, for instance, hell is a planet in the astral sea. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not like a pit in, in some sort of vague place on the Great Wheel. It's you got to fly there, and it looks like a giant planet. You got to like dig down into the core of it to get to the bottom. You know, mm-hmm. as for what it is, I, I think embracing the fact that it's this weird non-place that it doesn't have time, that it doesn't have space, that it exists purely in your mind, and that because of that, it behaves a lot like how you would expect it to behave. This isn't uh, Mage the Ascension where you can, you know, like just think of something and have it be reality. Um, it's, it's a place where it's like, well, why does, it, why does a sword work the way it does in a realm where everything's purely mental? I was like, because you expect it to. Yeah. And it doesn't work exactly the way a sword does, but it will hurt you because you expect it to. You yeah, know. you know what a sword does and you know, the outcome of interacting with it. Right, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it also presents unique challenges because it's just the idea of a sword, which means mm-hmm. it doesn't have mass, inertia, uh, you know, all of these things. A lightsaber. Basically, <laughs> kind of, <right? laughs> Except everybody has them, uh, and so everybody is that's moving. That's where all the Jedi went after Order sixty six. Exactly. They they well, I suppose that it, technically would be like what a Force ghost is, be like a psychic projection from the astral plane onto the oh material. My God. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll keep up. The you do a whole show sure. on that. It's a it's very alien. No gravity. No physical forces. No things like that. But it's also very accessible because you don't need to breathe. You don't need to eat. You need to sleep because that's a mental need. Mm-hmm. But if you're traveling there by something like say astral projection then the only thing you really need to worry about is keeping your silver cord safe and really you know unless you're fighting like an astral dreadnought or gif yonki you're pretty safe because only a few things can sever the cord and it's totally sweet because you don't have to worry about your body getting hurt or injured or anything like that you just sort of create a mental construct for yourself that you can explore the plane in yeah. And so as a place where a dungeon master can set like really weird adventures that break the rules of the game and have uh, you know different interpretations for what your stats mean and 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 the kind of creatures that live there are just even weirder than some of the other things it's much more accessible than say the inner planes which yeah. might not be habitable at all or even some of the outer planes you know just astral projection there you get your uh, spiritual body and go have some adventures and, and then come back to the real world and literally wake up from a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, I, what I love is that, like, and maybe it's just because I got done, just, gun, uh, just got done uh, listening to Snow Crash, my favorite book. Uh-huh. But it's like a magical virtual reality realm. Right? right, yeah. You form an avatar out of pure thought and you go adventuring around as you wait back in reality. Yeah, and, and even if you travel there physically, right, like you pass through a portal to the astral plane, the plane converts your physical mass into pure mental into a pure mental construct. It's and a so, weight loss program. Exactly, right. <laughs> you know, and, but you would have to be careful there because you're not traveling via uh, an astral projection. Yeah. If you, if you die there, you die. You're, you know, that's yeah, it. You're, yeah, you're actually putting yourself in, in harm's way. Yeah. Maybe needlessly. Maybe needlessly, yeah, certainly. And so uh, in second edition, basically you replaced anything that your strength mu- uh, score gave you with intelligence. Uh, that, that counts for combat. Your in- intelligence is how you base your movement. Uh, it, it, it really governs almost everything. You make intelligence checks to perform complicated maneuvers, to stop whenever you want to stop. Because one of the other qualities of the astral plane is that because you move at the speed of thought, you can move very fast. Mm -hmm. And yet visibility is very limited. Um, They recommend about, uh, I think, like 200 yards or something like that. But I I might even cut it uh, down even more um, just to sort of simulate the fact that there's nothing out there. You know, you have to get within proximity to something to kind of uh, see it and perceive it. 
and uh, it makes things like, um, you know, at those who are, are used to the astral, like, say, Githyanki, extra dangerous because they know that they can, say, do hit-and-run attacks and mm -hmm. draw part members of a party away so that they get out of visual distance of the rest of their companions, and yet, you know, the Githyanki are kind of used to that and can divide and conquer uh, a foe more easily. It's a weird place, but I think it's a bit more accessible maybe than DMs first give it thought because it doesn't have a physicalness to it. Mm -hmm. You can just go there, and, and it's relatively easy to justify, like, a ritualized version of a ninth level spell that lets you have that. Or like, yeah, go find a blue lotus and chew its flowers until, uh, you know, until you fall into a deep sleep. And uh, from there, you will enter the realm of dreams or something like that, whatever you want to call it. Oh, well, I mean, what you're describing is basically, like, Black Panther. Sure, like yeah. When yeah. Eats the, you know, eats uh -huh. the purple flower and you wake up in the, the freaking dream the spirit world. The spirit yeah, world. something, whatever it is, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I, I love that. So let's, yeah, let's talk about some different methods, conduits, portals, yes. things like that. I like to think of that if you were really good at lucid dreaming, you could probably wake up in the astral plane and actually retain your mental form sure. for at least a bit. Yeah. Just to kind of look around. Yeah. It might yeah, overwhelm yeah. you and you wake up, but still. Yeah. Like a very, very low grade astral projection. Sure. Yeah, I can certainly see that. And I think that like connecting it with dreams is also really interesting because like otherwise D&D &D doesn't have a plane or place of dreams. And mm -hmm. yet there's the, there are several spells that kind of interact with it. And, and it's really classic fantasy uh, dream, dream uh, prophecies or premonitions that come in dreams, things like yeah, that. Yeah, where's so, Kuba Gooding? Where's he coming from? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, treating it as this uh, otherworldly place, a uh, realm of magic, of dreams, is fun. And like offering mundane ways of getting there, I think, is also really uh, interesting because then it's, it is a more accessible place. You mm -hmm. know, if it's like, yeah, I remember this place. I was here in my dreams, you know. All right, well, we've got to go, like, find that place now where, where you've been going every night in your mind. Let, like, we've been, we're going to have to join you. And, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be asleep and we're going to, like, inception our way in. And oh, now we're going to be on the <laughs> astral. <laughs> some, yeah, some, some magic inception, like, <laughs> sounds great. And you do not want to get caught in limbo. It's a whole thing. No, you do not want thing. to. Yeah, you do not want to. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> what happens if we go that deep? You gotta go fight slot in Limbo. Right, yeah, <laughs> slip through a, a color pool. So, um, yeah, like just getting around the place, uh, I would say, is think about it in terms of uh, this is a mental place where you think that, you know, I'm thinking about moving in this direction. That's all it takes. It takes no effort to move. And so everyone in there uh, moves very fluidly, very gracefully. Uh, in, in that sense, it's, it's, it's something different than maybe the characters have perceived before. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be sound very weird, but I'm imagining mo everybody moving like they're doing Tai Chi. Because yeah, I'm when, I, see that, when yeah. I took that, one of the things they tell you, it's like the whole point of Tai Chi is the it's the internal. It's mm -hmm. the mental side. It's not the physical. So when you're doing 24 or whatever, the whole idea is you're moving your arms with your mind, mm -hmm. not your muscles. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, well, that's just dumb. But like... Well, you like, think about it for a hot second. But and you move yeah. everything with your mind. Sure, it's yeah. the whole point of you're not putting forth effort. Yeah. The the effort of moving your arms with your muscles is not what you're doing. It's the mental connection to the movement. And trust me, once you actually do it enough and start meditating, you actually go, oh, I get what you mean. Yeah. And it's it's very hard to explain sure. uh, how you move something with your mind and not your muscles. But hey, yeah, uh, yeah. When, once you like hit that zone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. man, you start feeling your freaking chakras open. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, there's, there's, I mean, I, I can imagine that, you know, what are some of the things you might find just as you're walking around the astral plane? You might find the psychic projections of a bunch of monks practicing their katas and forms and mm -hmm. things like that. And it, they're just, it creates a resonance yeah. on yeah. the plane, even if they're not aware that, that they've manifested there. And, and one, of the, one of the more interesting tidbits uh, within the second edition book. Tidbit, tidbit. Sorry. Is uh, the is, explicitly calls out that psychics, scions, and psionicists, psionicists, and the like, when they do psychic battle, it creates manifestations on the astral of their psychic warrior selves doing battle because it takes yeah. place in both realms simultaneously. And if they go to the astral plane and engage in psychic combat, then it's just bonkers because all of those subtle psychic effects have manifestations visually. The use of ego whip produces a whip. 
you know, Tower of Iron Will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think you're going to shields up like the Batmobile kind of uh, yeah. thing. <laughs> so. And that's awesome. That's your, that's your pay-per-view, Vince, in the astral plane. Uh, certainly. And yeah. you know what? Honestly, if I'm going on a jaunt to the astral, then I want to bring a psychic warrior with me because they are trained in this kind of combat. Yeah. This is why I don't see psychic and magic stuff and D&D as separate because it's already there. It, it's already baked into the sort of the setting assumptions. So consider how it looks like when you move. You think and just move. You don't actually need to produce movements. It takes no effort, no coordination. Um, in, the, in, a, in a game term sense, uh, you replace, um, you know, your strength is replaced by intelligence and your dexterity is replaced by wisdom. And then you reframe your constitution to be not uh, physical resilience and kind of hardiness and, and willingness to fight, but mental fortitude. Right. Your ability to fight off stress and worry and things like that. Uh, that is what um, it represents. And then charisma is relatively unchanged, uh, although I think if you were going to update it to more like, say, 5th edition mechanics, you would bring in charisma and maybe have charisma replace con. And, well, yeah, you know it's, I mean? it's, yeah, it's your persona. Your, it's your mm -hmm. force of will. and your sense and, of self. Yeah, that kind yeah. Of thing, yeah. If only because like charisma just didn't have that sort of connotations in second edition it really was and still it was sort of a dump stat. it was the dump stat or it was you know you needed to be a How martyr you, paladin yeah <laughs> or just you know you want to get a discount at the store or have right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe your dm was using the comeliness uh, stat substat uh, instead or something comeliness and homeliness yeah <laughs> so i you know it, it having taken on some of those uh traits that wisdom had i think justifies having it be uh, be there. And then you just ha run combat in such a way that, um, you know, it's about description. There's movement. It's a 3D environment as well. So you would want to keep track of both uh, the positions on the horizontal axis as well as vertical. And, you know, maybe you have like a vertical tracker or you use like combat risers or something if you've got minis. But just thinking about it in terms of the fact that this, that action on the plane takes place in this, Fluid, envi fluid environment with effortless motion that takes place at the speed of thought that changes so much about how you run combat encounters or just go about exploring the place. Uh, in second edition, they had something called uh, speed factors for initiative, and these were modifiers that you uh, that were applied to individual actions. Sometimes it, it um, mattered what weapon you were using, what spell you were trying to cast. And it created a very gritty, sort of detailed initiative system um, at the cost of sort of speed of play. And in the Astral Sea, all weapons have the same speed factor, unless they're magic, in which case they're faster. And it sort of reinforces the fact that this is all mental. You don't, you know, your brain doesn't need to, uh, you know, send a, a signal anywhere. It just has a thought and, and it happens. It's another one of those uh, things where because there's no natural healing, there's no time, there's nothing like that. The aftermath of a battle on the astral plane is often a weird place. Wounds, uh, you know, like globules of, of blood and, and, and the like are uh, floating through uh, the old battlefield. There's maybe uh, slings and arrows and bolts that are flying out from it mm -hmm. that, are, that don't stop. You know, there's nothing there to stop them. And as long as a thinking creature or a thinking being acted upon an unthinking object, it'll just keep doing what it's doing until another thinking creature acts on it. Yeah. Um, and so you've got uh, you know these things where it's, you might know that there's a battle nearby because you just occasionally you get pelted with old bullets, you know, sling bullets or uh, arrows or something. They don't lose any of their uh, force either because there's no nothing to stop their uh, you yeah. know, slow them down. They're an arrow flying, <laughs> flying through right. the nothingness. Uh, and so drifting out of sight during melee is, uh, is a worry. Uh, you might want to introduce something where it's like every turn, you've got to roll your wisdom to stay within a certain range of everybody so that you can still see them. Um, in second edition, there was an actual non-weapon proficiency of astral combat that was meant to cover things like maneuvering and sticking close together and, and sort of like dealing with this weird environment in combat situations. The third thing to worry about is that because this is a mental realm, it's also the realm of emotions and combat brings out violent emotions and trauma and the like, and that attracts creatures yeah. that exist on the astral plane. Specifically, it attracts things known as astral stalkers and astral searchers, which are stray thoughts taken out of a beings that are given life 
from a thinking being's mind that then become their own things. And they desperately want to get back into a mind. And oh. so they will, you know, they will uh, hijack illusions. <laughs> That's one of the fun things uh, when we get to talk about magic is these uh, astral searchers can take over your illusion spells. Um, but they can also possess you. And they are drawn to combat. Um, and so it's this, it is kind of a dangerous place in that sense. Um, it also presents a unique place to, uh, to have some action. While we're touching on magic, like, what do you think, how would you do, the, the, the astral plane is the realm of magic, right? Right, right. Magic is usually presented as a, a, at least a mental thing, mm -hmm. uh, judging by the three stats. So, like, how would you deal with magic in a place that, like, this is where magic kind of originates or, or certainly like it's easier to do yeah, yeah. Um, well I mean when you are in the warm glow of <laughs> the, the the weave of magic yeah. which the astral plane I think is yeah right mm -hmm. um, first off if you have to roll and like if there is ever a crit I mean like everybody needs to watch out mm. Mm. Like this is one of the things where it could be a bad thing right. if you if you make something so perfect mm. as a spell. Right. Like you could give life to a spell if you like. Ooh. I'm gonna roll firebolt. I rolled a twenty. Yeah, yeah. Now this little moat of fire like looks around as it's flying through the air and goes. Maybe I don't want to. Maybe I want to live. I want right. to. You know, like <laughs> it starts gaining sentience or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like things like that, where like when you really think about everything being suffused in magic i mean even hell maybe even your fighters if they do well enough and and think you know hard enough mm -hmm. maybe they could even do magic on a level on a, on level a certain of some level kind. Yeah. yeah yeah and I, I was kind of like thinking about that because in you know the the divide between sort of classes and everything was much stronger in in yeah, second yeah. edition you know but the more i sort of th was thinking about it i was like well you know how is it the fighter, and this kind of relates to what you're talking about with Tai Chi, the fighter has, their mind is already trained to act and behave in this way, and even though their muscles, you know, their sort of physicalness uh, it is, you, is attuned to the material plane, they still have the instincts yeah. of a fighter. So I might, like, for those classes, you know, yeah, your strength is replaced by your intelligence, but maybe you get to add your level uh, or something, some kind of compensation to recognize that, yeah, it's a mental construct, but mentally you're still a fighter. You're still a trained warrior. You still, uh, you know, have this um, capacity within you. Uh, and maybe if they're not, uh, you know, like a monk or a psychic warrior, it takes them a while to acclimatize to the place. But eventually it'd be like, well, your, your reflexes are just as good. You're just not used to thinking about them in this term or something. So yeah. instead of making it in second edition, I think there was even a house rule where you would flip the hit die so, like, fighters got D10 and magic users got, like, D4, but on the astral, you flip it, uh, and so fighters have D4 and, and magic users have D10, but I don't know if that was just something I did back in the day, <laughs> or yeah. I couldn't find it uh, in the rulebooks now. Yeah, but, it, I mean, that seems like a, a, a thing that you would want to do, though, just because if you're a magic user, you are more mentally adept yeah. at things. Yeah. On yeah. On average, on average, usually, yeah. And so that this is this is where like expanding your definitions of like what are the mental stats, and I really do think like D and D works nicely when you think of it in terms of there's three physical and three mental, mm -hmm. and and intelligence, wisdom, and charisma all as a whole represent your character's mind, which is a, a, another great sort of just thought experiment to kind of think of is mm -hmm. what is the relationship between your character's mind and their soul. You know, souls exist in, in Dungeons and Dragons, and, and uh, you know, there's got to be something in the translation from physical to mental that involves the soul. And I, and I just, you know, like, like thinking about those kind of things, because somewhere in there is a villainous plot to, uh, to, to, you know, to do some nefarious deed or something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, getting back to magic, got go off topic there, I think, like, one of the things that strikes me is that all the magic that deals with a physical space would be useless in the astral. Like, extra-dimensional spaces probably are, are nothing, you know, it doesn't matter. And I can't remember off the top of my head which of the, like if you are like if you bring a bag of holding or a haversack or something into the astral, if it has the same effect 
as it does if you put two extra dimensional in spaces inside each other or something. Oh, really? I don't know if it does or not. I know that like if you bring an extra dimensional space inside of another one, it has a possibility to rip a hole to the astral plane, uh, which is how you get things like vacuum rifts <laughs> that could be potentially hazardous. But could it be a way to get out though? <laughs> it might be a way to get out. I forget which. Yeah, I, I'm. I now. I think there was something. One of the D and D books or something like that happens. But I don't know. That sounds like a ruling that the D and D that your dungeon master would have to make. And I might just because it sounds clever and uh, any kind of cosmic. Uh, collateral damage I'm in favor of. Uh, so that would be things like disintegrate or, uh, you know, growth or anything that, like, deals with probably most of the transmutation school. <laughs> it's probably just not going to have any power. But, um, it, you know, the other thing to kind of consider is the lack of a ground, the fact that there's sort of 360-degree movement. You would want to look at individual spells and sort of see, like, well, all right, what does it mean if I create a wall of fire here? You know, uh, where is it anchor? Or if I'm trying to do, like, a web, can I even create a web in, in the astral plane? I mean, where technically, does it... no. Anchor. If it doesn't you know? have anything to anchor to. <laughs> right. If you want to try to try to say, well, I want to anchor it to people. Yeah. And let and, them be the anchors. And the, this, this is where it's worth pointing out that dead gods break a lot of these rules of the astral. So you, a dead god might be big enough to have its own gravity. Or it might be big enough that it imparts the rules of reality on this pocket of the astral so that you can't have more traditional um, adventures and the like. And the after echo of its, of its existence. Yeah, yeah. These, these you know cosmic beings of power who lie dormant in the backstage of reality. Just, yeah, they're weird. You find all kinds of weird stuff in them. Hey, any theater major will tell you some weird shit happens <laughs> What's backstage. backstage right? <laughs> yeah. um, so the other thing is that uh, mind magic and illusion magic uh, are, are more powerful on the astral. Mind magic in particular, enchantments well, and the like. I was going to say, enchantment finally gets its due. Yes, yeah. Like, I, I might rule as a DM if you cast some enchantment on the astral plane. All those subsequent rounds of re-rolling. Yeah, yeah. No, they don't really you, you fail that those. first one, guess what? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're hooked by that enchantment. You're hooked by that enchantment. I'd say that in second edition, it was you know you you took a penalty to your saving throw to uh, resist certain mind magic. I might impose like disadvantage or something like that yeah, on yeah. on the saves. But it's also that the um, the durations of these spells tend to be longer. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly though, one of the things you can do if you if you do want to get past some of the limitations of it is to train your mind to cast spells a certain way. Uh, in second edition, those were spell keys that would allow you to, you know, say, all right, well, I can't disintegrate unless I do this, you know, with my mind. And that might be like, think of those as like rewards for, uh, for your spellcasters. And they're like not quite feats, but they sort of function in the same way. Would take most of these things on a case-by-case -case basis and look at what the spell does, look at what the intent of it is, and if it creates something physical, then probably not. But if it's mental or just pure energy, then mm -hmm. you probably exist on the plane. Um, the other, oh my God, there's so much. Come on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, you know, because I mean, older editions like spells and items, wherever they were created, oh, yeah. no, they right. were better or worse depending on how far away they were. Yeah. And so, but what about magic items on the astral plane? Yeah. And what it, like, and can you create a magic item? In the astral plane, to take take create something purely mental and then bring it into and the then physical. Bring with you. it into the real world. Like yeah. to me, that would be the, like the perfect weapon for a psychic warrior. Certainly, a blade yeah. of thought that they created yeah. in their journey to the astral plane to seek enlightenment, Ooh, and yeah. then they come into the prime material, and that is how they can form a blade out of their hand. Yeah, yeah. It was for for one, like yes, you absolutely can. Like that's first of all, that's badass. That's totally in line with the the way that. Magic works here, uh, and and uh, particularly the the plane itself seems to be kind of uh, not sentient, but aware of when it is converting things from physical to mental. That having a place where you can forge things of pure mental energy and then bring them back with you obviously offers some interesting thoughts. Maybe that's where like psychic crystals and the like come mm -hmm. from. Uh, but in second edition and in the Great Wheel cosmology, your weapon decreased in power the further away you were from the plane that it was forged on. Yeah. So if you had a weapon forged on the material plane and you're going on to like the seventh layer of hell or something like that, well then you've got like, all right, it's got to go through the astral and then the outlands and then the first and second and third and whatever many layers until eventually it's like you don't even have a magic sword anymore. Yeah. 
That's why they always have those <laughs> plus ten weapons. And those those are the only are, thing you know, that you can take uh-huh. into another plane and actually still be worth the shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially, and it really, I'm not sure if layers actually, I might be wrong about the, the layers within a plane doing it, but certainly like if you had a sword or something forged on uh, Mount Celestia and you're going to the abyss, it's not going to help you out there. Yeah. Uh, and so having weapons forged on the astral because it touches all of these planes means that you have a weapon that's more useful in other realms. I, that was a second edition thing. I have no idea how many DMs kept up with that. The changes to spells, priestly magic, wizardly magic. There was a lot, a yeah. lot of things to keep track of depending on what plane you were on. Um, and so having a weapon forged from the astral just lets you bypass a lot of that. And mm-hmm. similarly by, say, worshipping a god that uh, resides on the astral, which there's not many... Um, because their spells don't have to travel that far to get to you. Their, mm-hmm. their uh, power doesn't. So uh, that's, um, that's kind of one way of thinking about the magic there. But uh, I'm kind of curious, like, the hazards, the just adventuring there in general. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you're, you, you, you've got these dead gods, right? You've got these sort of, like, islands that float, uh, and sometimes they look like, humanoids or something and other times they're just big chunky rocks and you know maybe they've got strange plants growing on them in defiance of the fact that there's no time or or you know the or air or, or, air or, or nutrients or yeah <laughs> you know but that's sort of the nature of the fact that you're these are gods they're the corpses of them in hibernation suspended animation they if you land on one of them you might uh start experiencing the memories of that deity you might relive uh, holy days or something or moments from the mythology that 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 sort of like was created or, or came out of their actions uh you could end up being changed by that uh you know mentally certainly uh, mm-hmm. kind of like sea mounts in the in the open ocean these dead gods attract what few things live in the astral plane to begin with right yeah like uh so you're more you're in more danger there it's where Githyanki set up their astral fortresses or, uh, you know, even worse things <laughs> that, uh, you know, hang out can be found there. But there are also these locations where it's like, you're going to have to go to that dead god and collect a piece of its heart. Or you're going to have to go there and collect these rare herbs or minerals. Or, you know, someone is in uh, exile on one of these places. They've, they've given up their bodily functions and now exist in a pure mental exile on a floating dead god somewhere you gotta go mm-hmm. find them bring them back bring them back home and then give them a burger like, <laughs> right away <laughs> yes that's the other thing is uh an interesting another interesting tidbit uh tidbit. the fact that you don't experience time but it catches up with you on your way back means that you're often very ravenous after spending a lot of time in the astral, and so uh, that's often a very good place to set up a restaurant because astral travelers will be hungry when they exit the portal. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that. that. Yeah, uh, that's why everybody should watch Avatar The Last Airbender. That's where Uh, Flavor Town's located. Yeah, Flavor Town. Oh, God. Oh, good God. So uh, some other things to keep keep an eye out for uh, are psychic winds. Um, these, mm-hmm. these could range everything from sort of like the stray thoughts that are looking for a new mind to call home, um, or it could be sort of like mental effects for individual PCs, but it could also be, um, you know, everybody on the, on the material plane is suffering like a nightmare. And so this sort of, it manifests on the astral plane as like maybe a dark cloud or, or sort of like purple lightning or something. And as it moves through the space where everybody else is, uh, they experience something like that, maybe take psychic damage or have some sort of debilitating condition apo- imposed on them. You could have it be that it's just sort of a light breeze of psychic wind, and they realize that they just start thinking thoughts that aren't theirs, and it's just a bit of color mm-hmm. that uh, you throw in as they're uh, thinking their way across this non-spatial place. Um, the One of the ones that I really liked are emotional tempests which will change the emotions of, of people uh, that are caught in them and, and either like draining them completely of emotion for a number of days or like causing them to experience a particularly intense emotion or something. Um, all of those are, uh, are, are a consequence yeah. of, uh, of traveling and adventuring in this place. And if you're taking more of the fourth edition sort of um, 
view of it, that this is, the, this is already the home of the gods, not just the road to get to them, then you have all kinds of things like angelic uh, uh, lanterns, uh, which is a fourth edition, sort of like oh, yeah. a, a remnant of divine spark that's just sort of left there. Maybe it heals or blesses you or something. Uh, to like geysers of astral flame, which are just these sort of radiant fires that uh, manifest throughout the place. Uh, vacuum rifts where someone's punched a hole in reality to get out of here <laughs> to escape. And mm-hmm. now there's like a pinprick hole leading to the material world and it's just like sucking everything into it. Or opposite, it's from the other side and it's just like blowing trees and dirt and rocks into this place, uh, causing a ruckus. But I think my favorite one from 4th edition is the Time Wrinkle, which um, basically (laughs) forces you to recalculate your initiative uh, as it constantly reorders time uh, around you. And so it's uh, it's just sort of a neat thing to kind of throw a wrinkle in the the combat sequence. Oh, Uh, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, you mentioned it a few times, the the Silver Cord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that can be... uh... That can be a big problem for you. Yes. So if the silver cord's severed, you're you're dead. You're kaput. Um, for the most part, it manifests, uh, you know, depending on the addition, either from your abdomen or between your shoulder blades, and you can about a foot of it is visible. Mm-hmm. If you can see invisibility or or have true sight or something, then you can see silver cords and conduits uh, and things like that, which we'll loop back uh, around to. But it is your lifeline between your astral body and your physical self. It's sort of the the conduit, a miniature conduit through which your magic flows through, your life force those flows through. Astral Dreadnoughts can sever it. Uh, those with a, a Githyanki silver sword uh, can sever it. Um, so it's something you want to keep safe. And, you know, in typical second edition fashion, there's a bunch of spells that interface with it and the like. Mm-hmm. But you would imagine that it's a part of you. So anything that protects you would also protect the silver cord, you know. So I, that's probably how I would extend it. And you know, unless we're dealing with like a full campaign set on the astral, then I'm probably not going to like threaten that silver cord very much. You know, if especially if you're using astral projection to get around, just because I don't want to like the whole point of being here, the whole point of using this thing is to be here to adventure. It should be at jeopardy because it's a element of the game world but like i'm not gonna specifically be like all right we're gonna we're out to get your cords mm-hmm. um so no none of that <laughs> bunch of get yonky with like silver cords around their necks of all the people they've taken right right <laughs> it could i mean like that there's certainly uh be something like that but i don't know that's not necessarily the point and it is it's you know it's also like well what happens if you get stabbed in the heart or you get your brain bashed in or something like that. Like I think why it stands out is because you're otherwise safe from harm. It's really the one way you can be permanently harmed, unless you get like a debilitating madness or some sort of psychic poison or something like that, and then you bring it back with you. Yeah, as you're kind of thinking about using this place, uh, one of the handier items from the second edition book was a list of travel times for how to get around this place. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're, if we're sort of running these down, it will show you why, uh, you know, for instance, why it's easier to get out than it is to find something. So a color pool is the most common feature on the plane. It is a two dimensional uh, pool of color and the fifth edition DMG has the chart for this, um, as well as some rules for psychic wind. They take you to different places, different planes. You step through them. It's like warm, gooey molasses, and now you're back on the physical world, that kind of thing. Um, so it takes you six plus D6 hours to reach a known color pool. You enter the astral. At best, you're 12 hours away from a, uh, a color pool. And if you're traveling to an unknown color pool, it takes six times D4 hours to get there. Uh, and uh, it only gets uh, ramps up from there. To visit a previously visited location, it would take you 10 times D4 hours to get there. Uh, And then to visit a location that you know by description only uh, would be 20 times D6 hours. And then to visit a location that you just really have a rumor of or something would take you uh, 50 times D10 hours uh, to get there. And that is moving at your fastest mental speed uh, that would get you there. Um, there are a variety of proficiencies that they introduce that I think would make interesting ways of using your skill proficiencies in new ways on the plane. Mm -hmm. And so like the ones that they introduce are things like astral combat, astral running, astral navigation, project thoughts. 
I look at these more as like new things you can do with uh, your ability scores and proficiencies. So maybe if you're trained or proficient in Arcana, then you're very good at say uh, using projecting your thoughts onto another person to slow them down because that's how you prevent someone from catching up with you when you move at the speed of thought is to throw uh, intrusive and unhelpful thoughts their way so that they have to mentally deal with them instead of concentrating on moving. Mm -hmm. And so it's a skill to be able to project your thoughts outward to create kind of like a psychic screed in mm -hmm. your opponent's mind so that you can outrace them. Um, so you just sing that erasure song and get it stuck in their head. Right, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the new ones are, would be astral combat. This is the skill of maneuvering and maintaining your orientation in combat. I see that as an intelligence uh, proficiency. There's astral running, which is uh, moving at increased speeds over long distances. And I would throw con. Come on, guys. Con needs its own skill proficiency. Why not give it astral running? Uh, <laughs> both. Well, what about all of its other? Oh, right. Oh, right. Yes. Um, astral navigation and tracking. I think wisdom maps onto this perfectly. And this is like how to follow someone, say, emotional signature through the realm to find them again. Mm -hmm. um, project thoughts we mentioned uh, as being one. Uh, and then the last one would be sense emotion. Like you, you, you know, are you able to like read people more? Uh, you know, this would be like a, a, a use of an intuition or wisdom, something like that. In my opinion, those are really kind of all you would need to structure an adventure around there. How you move around, that kind of thing. In terms of what's there, not much. Yeah. <laughs> Githyanki and pretty much anything capable of traveling through interplanar distances is you'll probably find there. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not really a lot of like native things other than those astral searchers that are stray thoughts. Um, and I'd treat those like ghosts or something like that, you know. Oof. That's probably how I'd treat those. So this was one of those videos where it's like, you know, what in the world do you do on the astral plane? Like it's, it's not a place that I, you know, it's a place that I tend to overlook and, and uh, or don't really like interface with uh, or, or include as game elements. But looking at doing some investigation into it, like man, you could have so much fun, yeah. just like sailing the astral sea. Uh, well, I mean, and 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 traversing dead god dungeons. And, yes, uh, you know everything like that. It also is like it's a good baseline to like come up with your own sort of cosmology for. So, for me, in like Land Between Two Rivers, I, it's the astral plane. P L A I N, uh, right. and it's it is a it's sort of a grassy star, you know, you know, flat expanse of sort of pale grass and a starry sky above, and it's mm -hmm. where it's where Kal Drogo is riding right now. Right, yeah, it's where, it, yeah, exactly, right, and it, it it's the place where, especially for those that uh, in the setting that are are from like the steppe or or something like that, it's. The place where you go to ride eternal, shiny, and chrome. You know, yeah. that's where you do that. And then at the same time, there are those that interpret it as more of the astral sea. And it's like, yeah, at night, on certain nights, depending on what the moon's like or if the stars are right, you could just find that you, the sun never rises and mm -hmm. that you sail forever on this mirror glass ocean that reflects the stars above you. And it's this sort of silvery void that you sail through. And one day as you're looking down and you, you realize that the reflection of your ship in the water isn't a reflection and that your ship is now twice as big. It extends out from the bottom uh, as well. You know, there's all kinds of astral whales and other things that just swim there and, and sort of exist. And um, I don't know, th that I like mixing the traditional D&D lore, but just taking it in a different direction and, and offering something different mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is always a fun way to present the planes. So, yeah. yeah, because uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange can't have all the fun. Certainly not. Jeez. Yeah. Come on. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, Web DM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Oh,